We are ready and waiting for you now If it's a fight that you dare see We've applied our strength through pain No more are we pathetic and we You are the reason why we claim That we've all become this way And I regret this prison that I've created for myself You are watching or listening to the Music is Life podcast You're either watching it on YouTube Or you're listening to it wherever you download your podcast from I finally got it right. Yes. Anyways, this is Lou Mavs, and I'm in the studio. Okay, I'm not in the studio. I'm in the middle room in my house, wrapping up part three of my interview with George Fullen. I just want to thank everyone who's watched part one and part two. Part three is basically going to go into the final days of Pi and also the final days of General Studios and what George is doing now. Also gonna be talking about some of the other bands that he produced that are probably more well known in the hardcore and metal worlds and the pop worlds. I hope you enjoy what you're about to watch and listen to and I'll catch you at the end. And I think the last band that you were working with at the time at General was Black Anvil, who you were working yeah. with them, but I think before they signed with Relapse. Black Anvil was friends of mine from the scene, like, but just, you know, Gary from Kill Your Idols, me and him were best friends from when we were 16. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he he played bass in, in Clockwise and left to start Kill Your Idols. Stayed close with them. You know, I did a little bit of recording for Kill Your Idols, but when they were coming up with Black Anvil, it was like, man, I love it. Now, I told him I never recorded a black metal record before, but I hear this as this should be brutal sounding. This should be brutal and dirty and with a lot of attitude. And they sort of heard the same thing. And we, we you know, kind of came up with that first record sound or sound like, I don't, you know, to me, I was, I was thinking of like early Venom records. Listening to it, it was a raw production, but it still sounded good enough that it was well produced, but it still had that edge to it. But when you're recording black metal vocals, a lot of people think they could get away with doing like the fry vocals, where it's like they're not putting any energy into their voice or not getting yeah. enough air from their diaphragm and taking out. How hard is it to record black metal vocals? And like, how much does it take out of the singer? He's singing loud. So I did the first Black Anvil record and then we did the second record. But the second record wasn't done at General Studios. I was already at a General Studios. We, mm. we did that at a couple of little studios uh, on Long Island. But Paul, at that time, I mean, that was the first time he was singing on something. You know, that was the first time he was singing lead on anything. Mm -hmm. But like, he had his vocals down. Like, he had demoed a bunch, but he's singing loud on that stuff. There's some metal records where I'm recording where I'm like, you know, I get my mic breeze to a point where I think it's going to be. And then it's like, I could hardly hear the singer. There was like a metal band I recorded from the Bronx where he was, uh, he was in, in, inwardly singing the whole time. Inward singing? I yeah, only he, heard about he, that in today's just... He's sucking in. But that's a thing. I, I was like, what are you doing? And I was like, you, you know, you had to reset the mic. Because it's pretty quiet where he's like, and I'm like, Ugh, all right. That's different than like a pissed off scream where Paul yeah. was like, Paul had a proper scream. I mean, he was killing it. I do a thing that any, I used to have a bat, any kind of person who plays guitar and sings from any, from a singer songwriter standpoint, or whatever, I always put a bat in their hand while they're doing vocals. So they have something in their hand and it feels like they're playing live. They usually record it separate. They don't have anything in their hands while they're singing. So yeah. how'd you learn that was a better technique? Because someone once told me every singer owns their instrument. And if you approach a vocalist as it's someone who's playing an instrument, it's an instrument. And if you treat it like an instrument, oh. one of the things to me was making the singer comfortable is oh. like getting a good setup on a guitar or tuning a piano. Mm -hmm getting them comfortable to perform they could hear right in their headphones there's some people you got to agitate a little bit because you want a certain performance out of them but like if you really treat it like a physical instrument then like this person that sits and practice practices three times a week and sings these songs and tours and plays live and sings these songs with a bass in their hand why are you going to put him in a room with just headphones on that person wants to hold something because they're used to kind of like clinching up or holding something or being something to make them more comfortable to sing and like I do it all the time now. Like the, the Ice Cold Killers, Joe Rubino is the singer in that band and he's a, he's the bass player. So it's like, you know, time to do vocals. It's like, here's something heavy to hold. It was like, he held like a part of a mic stand. 
or a cane mm-hmm. or something, you know, like the studio we recorded didn't have a bat, but it's, <laughs> it's just, just, it's just a physical holding something. And he was like, you know, change the way I sing it. I feel more like I'm singing live. And to me, like feel is more important than sound on anything. If it feels right, I like it. If it sounds right, then I extra like it. But like, you know, a lot of people will say like that first Black Anvil record doesn't, it's not winning any awards for Sonic, but it feels fucking great. It That's what I love like about it. That's exactly what I love like about it. you're experiencing that band in a fucking shitty club in Brooklyn, you know? <laughs> um, and to me, that was important. Like, I, you know, I, I always want records to feel better than than they, you know, than they sound when it comes perfectly together. I mean, that's that's kind of you know perfect. But a lot of people always say like your records feel great. They might not sound. You actually have a page on Discogs, which I was like, hey, cool. I know somebody who's on Discogs. And if you look through all the bands that you've worked with, I know of all these bands, and to me, it's incredibly yeah. impressive. There's the Repercussions. Oh, I love that record. <laughs> I know Jonathan Roran, who's the brother of one of the band yeah. members, and yeah. J-Ro, he was a friend of mine that I met at Viacom. He was so well-versed when it came to music. Like, I yeah. mean, you could ask him a question about anything, and he would know about a specific band or a specific genre. Yeah. Like, he, he worked was, at Tower Records forever. One time he's like, do you understand the greatness of High and Dry by Def Leppard? It was like Junior ACDC. And then yeah. Pyromania came out. Boom! And he's like, and that's where they lost me. And I'm like, the fact that he just praised my favorite Def Leppard album shows he knows what he's talking about. Moving right along, there was Action Action. I remember them. I think you you actually recorded a cover of them doing Tonight She Comes, correct? Did you do that one? Yeah. That was a good um, cover. That was the first time I recorded drums in the small studio. They were like, we have to do this cover. Can you record drums in your studio? And I was like, I can't record drums in my studio. And I like, piece together all these different little mixers and mic freeze to get the drum sound on that thing and like i i don't know i love it that wasn't action action that was the reunion show that was a reunion show you covered that, yeah that because covered the, the cars? they were the reunion show first and then they sort of lost some members and reformed to be action action right but when they released the single they released it as action action so that's probably, probably what happened yeah and you i recorded- mean i did two i did two records for action action and i you know not i think those records sound pretty good but that's me and whitman working together that's mm-hmm. whitman singing me engineering so. there's also on Rabe. i remember those guys when i saw them actually at the downtown it was a sunday matinee show unearth was the headliner there was every time i die nora non and they put on a sick show yo they were good that's a good band that's a band that i always thought should have should have done better i would wish for them too I see Alicia Keys is also on there. I have a funny Alicia Keys story. If you're comfortable talking about it, please do. So Alicia Keys bought a studio in Glen Cove that was down the block from Pi. Um, she lived somewhere on Long Island and she she had a room. And the way Alicia Keys makes records is she always has three or four songs going at once. So when it came time to finish her record, she would book out Pi and she would pay full rate at Pi, but, you know, by the time Alicia Keys was at Pi, Pi was basically a private studio. I wasn't working there anymore. So was her studio was, more of like a pre-production studio then? No, her studio was like a proper, her studio, she put two really nice consoles in and built them out. I mean, it was it was a proper major label studio. It just was her place to go write and stuff like that. But she's so prolific and, and talented mm-hmm. that like she could be in three places at once. And what she would do is she would start the mixing process of her record and she would start mixing at Pi mm-hmm. while she was then overdubbing at her place. But then because Pi had the Steinway and all that stuff like that would come and do a little bit of recording at Pi and between like songs being mixed, it, it just was this whirlwind of stuff. But like I was hired to like babysit the sessions because Perry didn't have a staff at Pi anymore. When he wanted to record, he would call me up and we'd get together and do a project that he wanted to do, or he would find someone else, you know, to like do it with, or him and Whitman would do some stuff. And uh, he's a vintage guitar dealer, so he was making money somewhere else and and Pi just kind of laid dormant. But Alicia Keys understood what Pi was, that it was this amazing studio that like didn't exist anywhere else at this time. Mm-hmm. and and would come and book it and part of the package was like i would show up you know she had some pretty famous mix engineers but they weren't like in the headset of recording <laughs> so like i'd set up some mic up and then 
one of her assistants would do some recording into, you know, into Pro Tools or if they wanted to go to tape or something, I'd bounce it back. So like, I hardly did any engineering on it. I was more of an assistant engineer or just more of a studio, studio like chief engineer liaison. Perry would pay my rate. So I'd make bank because he was making money and he goes, you know, I should share this money with you. And he'd, he'd pay me. I would make more money sitting in the studio with Alicia Keys than I was making at my place. So what I would do is I would try to book my place out. I had several engineers that would that would come and do some stuff that could work in Queens without me, either like my assistant or whatever. Like, get your, you know, hey, you can get a cheap day in at Douglaston. Like, get your band in. Like, I would try to hook up my assistants to get them to know the room better. It's like a normal thing. Like, you 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 help people out. The Alicia Keys thing, they were great. I you know I I work crazy amount of hours for two weeks and make a and make enough money to then pay the bills in Douglaston. It was fucked up. Um, but that's how the music industry goes. So yeah. the, towards the end of the last thing she did there, like the last thing I worked on, they're talking about credit, credits for the record, spell your last name. And I was like, no, I'm good. <laughs> and they were like, what do you mean you're good? And I was like, I'm, you know, I'm not really doing anything on the session. I, I don't need credit. Right. And the fucking engineer was like, you know, like a major mix engineer. Like, you know, he has sponsored plugins on Waves. Like I use one of his plugins because I like it on, you know, Waves plugins for Pro Tools. Like he, he's like a, a proper engineer who's, who's mixed on that record. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm like, yeah, I don't need credit. And he's like, what the fuck are you talking about? You don't need credit. He goes, you're working on an Alicia Keys record. And I was like, what am I going to get? Assistant engineer credit? And he's like, yeah, that's what I was going to put you down. He's like, you've been helping me all week. You, you help with the sound. You help me like learn the room. You know, you do all the stuff. Like, you know, I really respect the work we've been doing together for the last two weeks. And I was like, I was like, yo, I record records. I'm a producer and an engineer. And I was like, I have an indie cred. I was like, and in a fucking 2008, if my name shows up as an assistant engineer on a Alicia Keys record, it's like people won't even think I'm the same person. It doesn't look good. If you're, if you're a fucking hardcore band or metal band that wants to come to New York and record a record with George Fullen, and then you see that he's an assistant engineer on an Alicia Keys record, that's not fucking cool. And he goes, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> And he goes, just to fuck you. He's like, or make sure that your name is on this record. What a dick. <laughs> it's not a dick. It was like we were kind of joking and funny about it. And then, like, you know, a day later, he goes, I don't even want to ask you anything anymore. He's like, I don't even want to ask you how this song sounds right now. You're such a dick. <laughs> like, we were laughing about it, but it was, you know, I was a little serious. Like, I don't need credit on an Alicia Keith. Like, no offense to Alicia Keith. Dude. I saw Alicia Keys play piano and sing, and it was fucking amazing. Like, they, you know, one of those top musical moments in my life, just hearing her, like, how good she is. And, like, she's phenomenal, but, like, I don't need an assistant engineer credit on her record. I understand, I don't yeah. Need people, it, it was just one of those things. So, you know, and you know, I look back to those times, and they were fun and good, and, like, I, but, I, uh, I would agree with you. I definitely think she's one of the best singer songwriters of the last 20 years. Yeah, and she's another person that that doesn't show all that she's talented to do, because of like you know record label whatever, and they want her to be a certain way, and there's an image behind her, and there's a machine that works behind her. But like the truth of that thing is like you know she could write the next Baby Shark. Well, I mean, she just strikes me as a person who is all about the music first before anything. Yeah, and from what people that I know of who have had the pleasure of meeting her. They say her kindness speaks volumes. And I think that's a, a wonderful thing because I've had the unfortunate displeasure of meeting a lot of my favorite bands who have been around since the 80s, even before then. Like I remember telling this on the Rats Eye Review show, my worst ever experience meeting musicians was meeting the Scorpions and meeting Quiet Riot. Um, <laughs> rest in peace, all due respect to Kevin Dubrow and Frankie Benali. Yeah. yeah, we did something with the Scorpions up high, and it was rough. Oh, really? What was that like? Uh, I don't want to tell you. I can't even tell that story. Okay, fine. Yeah. I won't, we won't mention it. But then I meet a band like the Deftones, and they're just like chill guys, you know? And I admit that that was probably the last time that I was starstruck because I'm like, this is right when White Pony came out. And I had seen them at uh the roseland and glassjaw was the opening act hmm. so here yeah, i am I I'm, yeah so here i am psyched to be seeing glassjaw i got asked by roadrunner records by jen miola who was my radio rep what's up jen 
to uh, interview um, Daryl from Glassjaw. And I got to meet him and I'm with my buddy, I'm, I'm with Jay Crawford. And then we, we walk out the door, then we we'll look to our left and there's Abe Cunningham drinking a beer. And he's just like, hey guys, what's up? We're like, you're Abe from the Deftones. He's like, yeah, man, what's going on? And I'm like, and we're telling him that we're from WSJU, St. John's University. Mm-hmm. He's like, oh yeah, Pirate Radio. I said, no, that's WSOU, we're mm-hmm. WSJU. He's like, oh, what station are you? I said, we were 590 AM. And he said, <laughs> oh, can I hear you guys? And I said, you can't even hear us in the parking lot of our school. Yeah. He's like, oh, that's okay. You want me to cut <laughs> a station ID for you? Like he offered to do it. Sick. And yeah. we were just like, yeah, sure. And he's like, hey guys, come on, come on to the back. And Jay and I are looking at each other. We're like, what's going on here? So then he opens the door and we're in the green room. There's Steph Carpenter, there's Frank Delgado. And we're just like, oh my God. And they're like, hey guys, come on in. You want some beer? You want some food? You know, Steph's over there lighting a bowl. He's like, you want some? I'm like, "Uh, no thanks. (laughs) But that was friggin' awesome. And like at the end of the show, we got to meet uh, Chino. And that was cool. And then all of a sudden, like I see some other dudes from the hardcore scene there. Members of H2O were there, which were cool. And then all of a sudden, like uh, we're talking with somebody and we're joking around about the Step Kings because Jay had seen the Step Kings a bunch of times. And in case anyone doesn't know who the Step Kings are, Bob McLinn, the bass player, ended up becoming the manager of Fall Out Boy. So Jay starts impersonating Bob McLinn and someone's cracking up. And then we turn around and it's Bob McLinn standing there, mm. realizing Jay's <laughs> impersonating him. And he just thought it was the funniest thing. He's like, hey, man, you guys want some beers? We're like, we're 19. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was such a fun night. And um, that was, uh, that's when I was just like, wow, you know, you can be a musician and not be a dick about it. You know, it's like, yeah, that that was a that was an eye opening experience for, for me. And and again, I, I think the hardcore scene that I remember growing up loving that that was part of that. Cause like I said, when I was classmates with Warren, when I got to go to shows and, and meet with people and you just, you know, just realize, well, they're just regular people and this is what they do. I mean, I remember seeing Earth Crisis at uh, Lamore opening for In Flames and we were hanging with Scott. We were just like, uh, Scott Krause, the guitarist of Earth Crisis. Mm-hmm. We were like, hey, Scott, good show tonight. He's like, thanks man. You know, we're just talking whatever. It was just cool to finally be a part of something where it was just normal people playing music that you can listen to and just enjoy and be like, yeah, this is mine. I mean, that was always like, there should be no difference. Like people are people. (laughs) Yeah. There really is no difference because someone could do something or they write a good song or they do something. It's like, yeah, you celebrate it in listening to their music and supporting them. But like, why fucking kiss their ass or why should they be better than anyone else? Like, you know, I, I always found that the people coming up had the biggest attitude where the, you know, I think I met one of the, you know, I've worked with for a couple of days, the biggest rock star in the world, you know, besides a Beatle, Keith Richards on a Rolling Stones record. I spent a couple of days with him and they mixed a song called Thief in the Night that he sang on. It's on a, it's on a record called Bridges to Babylon. And I mean, that's the one that had the hit single, Anybody See My Baby, I think, if I recall, recall well, correctly. Yeah, which was Katie Lang's song. That was a Katie Lang song? So, well, Keith technically, the chorus is very reminiscent of Constant Craving. To the point where they had to pay her royalty. Oh, shit. And, and she's a co writer on the song on the album. Wow. And Keith, and Keith was talking about that while we were in the studio together because the record was done. So they had a problem releasing that record and that single because it's, it is constant craving. And Mick just probably heard that song and stuck in his head and he wrote, you know, be my baby. It's a like constant craving. Craving, yeah, exactly. Um, which, was, which was awesome. But, I, you know, I spent four really long days with Keith. And he, he walked into the studio and came over to me and goes, hey, you're, are you George? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, Oh, I'm Keith. We're going to be working together for a couple of days. I was like, oh, nice to meet you. And he goes, oh, I'll leave you alone. I was aligning a tape deck, you know, mm-hmm. to his, his, I was setting the session up. And then from there, we were, he was cool. He was, I have tons of stories about hanging out with Keith Richards and he was cool. And I'm, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a punk kid. So like, I, you know, a punk hardcore kid. So I, I didn't, Rolling Stones, I didn't like them that much. They're not, they're not doing 
much for me, the Stones. Mm. Um, but spending time with him and and just seeing how cool and and you know, I don't know how down to earth a guy like that can be, but he's pretty down to earth. We you know <laughs> we talked about a lot of stuff. He one of his dogs had passed away a few months, and he was just telling me stories about his dog and how he misses <laughs> wow. his dog. And it was like it was wild. Like it's amazing because like, you know, you think that you end up liking the person, even if you don't like their music. And sometimes you can, you can probably despise someone's personality, but you know, you like their music. It's an interesting dichotomy because when you think about it as people, you'd rather support the nice guy and see him succeed and, and wish the best for him. Meanwhile, the guy who probably writes the best song from uh, since twist and shout you know, it could be the biggest tool bag in the world. And yeah. it's just like, oh, I hate him, but fuck, he could write a good song. Yeah. I mean, what, you know, one of my favorite bands from Long Island of all time, still to this day, is this band called Garden Variety. Like, I love Garden Variety. Own everything they've ever put out in their demo. I still listen to it, you know, monthly, if not weekly. It's, mm-hmm. it's just on constant rotation you know, for the last 25 years or however long they were band, early on, somebody complained about like one of the guy's personalities in the band. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I would go to, you know, I'd go to garden variety shows and, and try to get them on clockwise shows. And, and, you know, they didn't do that well in Long Island, but they toured a lot. You mm-hmm. know, I think because they didn't do well in Long Island, they toured a lot. And they were pretty, a pretty popular band up and down the coast. And at the time and like, fuck, they're fucking good. But like, you know, I heard one of the guys was not a nice guy and I never met them. I never talked to him. Mm-hmm. And we lived in the same, and then like later on in life, we lived in the same neighborhood in Brooklyn. I would see him all the time at the coffee shop. He knew who I was mm-hmm. and I knew who he was and I still didn't talk to him <laughs> oh. because I was afraid that if he was an asshole, it would ruin a little bit of garden variety for me. And I'm, you know, and he's probably a wonderful person. Right. But just because I heard that thing early on, I was like, man, I don't, Sometimes, sometimes you just need to meet the that, person. I don't want that. Yeah, I don't want that guy to ruin the music for me. You know, Alkaline Trio is one of my wife's favorite bands. She has a fucking Alkaline Trio tattoo with one of the members. She did some art show or something like that, and she was like, "Fuck, <laughs> I don't know if I can listen to Alkaline Trio anymore." It's funny that we're talking about this because I remember one of the most intimidating moments of my life. I stated before that my old band, we did a show where we opened for the hardcore band Punch Your Face. This is in 2003. This was at uh, Fuzzy's Wolf Rose. So it was the border of Queens and Nassau County. Now, I don't know if you recall the band, but at one point there was a, an onstage scuffle between them and the band Barrier Dead from Connecticut. And, you know, they made it a point to call out what they would call emo bands in their songs and this and that. And At the time, I guess you could say that the band was borderline emo because like I mentioned, the bass player was really gearing towards trying to get on like a drive through records. Although I said, "Uh -uh, if I'm writing it, we're doing it my way. But I I, I tried to appease him as best I could. So I remember here we are, we're we're booked on the show and I see all these dudes with like, you know, the bandanas and like, you know, they're, they're wrapping up their fists and whatever. And then they're just talking, you know, amongst themselves over by the bar and we're about to go on stage. And I'm looking at my drummer and I'm like, there's nobody up in front. So I just started the riff to Rain and Blood from Slayer. And then all of a sudden, like 25 guys just come up. And then we start our set, gets into the hard parts. They start pit dancing or whatever. Yeah. yeah. By the end of the show, Punch Your Face comes up to us and they're like, yo, man, you guys are really good. You want to go on tour with us one day? And I'm like, yeah, how did... How did I just win over punch your face? And it's just like, <laughs> it, it was the craziest thing. And, you know, it's, I, the point is don't let what people tell you give you preconceived notions. I would definitely yeah. say give yourself enough leeway to get to know them before you come up with your, your final judgment on them. But don't give too much of you away just in case they do burn you, you know, just I think yeah. it's good to have some kind of reservation. You also worked with Biohazard on Uncivilization. What was that like? Because that was the last album I think they did with Evan before he so, decided to go into full-time <laughs> porn. I did. Yeah, I did do some. I did. No, Evan was in a band called Spiders. I did a bunch of recording for. You worked with Spiders? Yeah. Oh, shit. I didn't even know that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Um, so I'm assuming you met Tara Patrick then. Yes, I did, but I didn't really know who she was. Mm. Um, I have to say that Evan had a really cool dog. It was like a bond, bomb, bomb sniffing, like protecting dog. It's like a German Shepherd. It was like a German Shepherd, but it was called something else. But it looked like a German Shepherd. It looked like a brindled German Shepherd. Mm. It was awesome because it would show up at my studio and just walk around, sniff everywhere. Because I'd be like, "Oh, you brought your dog," and I'd go to pet it. And be like, "No, let it work." And for like ten minutes, it would sniff everywhere, and then come and go. You know, everything's all right. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then i'd be like can i pet him now he's like yeah and he's like all right be a dog and i can pet him and play with him and stuff like that that's cool um, that was cool experience but so so you know billy from biohazard great engineer great producer and then the, you know the drummer from biohazard who danny is Schuller. A phenomenal danny was like phenomenal engineer they owned a studio but they wanted to mix on a neve and mm-hmm. um and you know I, I had met Evan a few times through people and he called me up and he's like, Oh, I heard you, you know, I heard you work at a six studio. So I kind of hooked up that session and got him a good rate and got him in there, you know, but didn't, didn't do, didn't do a ton of engineering on it. Um, just kind of like chief engineer, you know, like, you know, assisted or whatever, like liaison the studio for it um, and did some stuff, but you know, they, they were like set up a pro tools, you know, set up a pro tools rig in the live room. So they could do some recording while the album's being mixed. They had a good mixer come in and mix that record. Um, that was a lot of fun, that record. You know, and I was in and out of the studio. I was at Pi. I got to sing background vocals on a Biohazard song. That is pretty awesome. And, you know, my 15-year-old self through the moon. Biohazard was my first exposure to seeing a hardcore band on MTV. Because at yeah. the time, Punishment was played all the time. All the time. On Headbangers Ball. And love that song. I still do to this day. Going to Sundance and being that, like, you know, they, they were sort of like that crossover stuff. But also, like, Danny, like, th- those beats he was playing were, like... They were insane. Hip-hop beats to, like, metal stuff. But then straight hardcore stuff. And also seeing them live, even before their first record came out, was, like, insane. There was a good show. I think I remember uh, Evan was a bass tech for Peter Steele back when he was still in Carnivore. Biohazard started from that. I think that Danny and Louie... Uh, Danny from Biohazard and Louis from Carnivore, two of my three favorite hardcore drummers. Who's, who's your first? Or who's who's the other one? I really have to give it to Pokey, Pokey Mo from Leeway and currently at Agnostic Front. Really? I mean, he's good, but like to me, Sammy. To me, it's Sammy and then Mackie from the Chromax. He was, you know, Youth of Today. He's 14 years old. He's playing those fucking drum beats in Youth of Today. And then. He wasn't always the drummer you could say, but he, he's actually on my favorite seven inch. And then he played on that glass draw record. Yeah, he played on everything you wanted to know about science. Yeah. I'm not taking anything away from Sammy at all. It's just for me, Leeway and a shout out to Eddie Leeway. He's recuperating from cancer. So, yeah. you know, cheers to you. I actually donated to his GoFundMe. So if you can look up his GoFundMe and please give him a little something, you know, just, just to help him out. Cause the guy's done so much for music in New York, a living legend and let's keep him around. I just love the stuff that he did on those leeway records. I mean, it's funny cause leeway to me was the hardcore equivalent of anthrax. And I just hear similarities in Eddie's and Joey's voices and yeah. the music is just phenomenal. And I love what he was. I love I what he way all the time. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I love what he did with Lee Wayne, and I love the fact that he's in Agnostic Front right now. Mackie, I love what he did with the Chromax, and he's still with John Joseph, I think, that version yeah. of the Chromax. So much love and respect for him. It's just because Danny was my first, and I just love what Louis did on the first Carnivore record. So, yeah. I mean, it's so, it's so, that's so really crazy. It it's so crazy because, like, all these fucking classic bands that we're still talking about 35 years later or something like that you know 30 25 mm-hmm. and it's i admit like, I'm, the, I'm late to the game i am the, fucking late yeah. to the game because i was born in 1980s so you know i didn't yeah. get to experience it to me it's like if you want to move forward you have to look back on what the groundwork was you know when it comes to but, metal it's black sabbath and priest when yeah. it comes to you know hardcore you know you have to give it to minor thread agnostic front bands like that and you know i think it's important to keep that spirit alive yeah but the but the drummers that you just mentioned are so fucking are animals they're so fucking talented mm-hmm. where it's like i, I, I apologize we didn't even, we didn't even mention our mom from sick of it all 
yeah yeah another motherfucker like they're so good and so solid it's like mm -hmm. and all that you know fuck click tracks and quantizing and all that crap that they do now to music mm -hmm. it's like it's real playing and real feel i mean they go into those fucking fast beats it pushes a little bit and they fucking go halftime you feel it mm -hmm. you can't you can't do that on a computer it doesn't fucking work no like, to me, the best drummers always had like a weird swing, like the you know the drummer from Slayer, Dave He'd Lombardo. Those beats, yeah, but there's like a weird swing to those beats. It's danceable. It's feel like you feel it. It because you quantize he, the shit out of that. It's gone. Remember, he comes from a Cuban background, so he brings yeah. in Latino flavor to it. And same with Sepatora, like that that South American metal drummer is like. Mm -hmm. Mm, yeah, I mean, I mean, if you think about it, it was, it was such a bedrock of talent and inspiration that came from like most of the underground stuff of the '80s, and to me, that's what like that's the metal that 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 that's close to me. I mean, say what you will, yes, the hair bands, you know, they had their time and they had they had their time in the, yeah. in, in the spotlight. They weren't but, you. Yeah, but I, pull back. I, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not taking away away anything from them in terms of their success and whatever, but it's just for me that 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 dirty underground feeling was yeah. what you know catered to me as a kid growing up. But also like the you know the talent it cultivated, and there probably was some sort of you know competitiveness, but unspoken because again it's the hardcore seed and everyone's kind of buddies or whatever. You knock, you know, you, 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 you know, some of that had to rub off. Some, you know, some of those guys had to be a chosen, like, yo, he's fucking playing that. Holy shit, I'm going to go home and try to play that. Mm -hmm. And then, and then what that built off. But it's, you know, think about, you know, think about through the 80s and like, you know, just, just looking at the different scenes of like, you know, Bad Brains influenced Minor Threat. And then it's like Minor Threat influenced, you know, all these different people. And then, you know, and then, you know, Bad Brains moves to New York City. Because they, mm -hmm. you know, they weren't really welcome in DC anymore, mm -hmm. and it's like how New York just explodes after a couple of months of the bad brains here. It's like you just and get it, the explosion of music because of this one band shows up and fucks everyone. Like, <laughs> and it's funny that we're talking about the away. we're talking about the bad brains because one of the things that we were talking about before the interview started, you know, we were just shooting the shit and we were talking like George remembers at the time where. The hardcore scene was, I, I dare say, in, infested with white power skinheads as opposed to Doc Martin skinheads who hated the white power skinheads and they would beat the shit out of them any chance they get. But the bad brains are four Jamaican Rastafarians from DC who without them, I don't think hardcore as we know it would have become a thing. You know, yeah, four, no, I don't. four jazz influenced punk rockers yeah from I you even, know you know you you look back and it's like the the rastafarian thing i don't even you know i you know watch a lot of documentaries on the bad brains and stuff like that and that that wasn't even that huge of an influence when they they just wanted to play fast they just yeah. were, were four dudes that wanted to play fast and like you know it said early on the hr you know was trying to be elvis and it's like he ended up becoming hr and i'm just glad yeah. about that it was fucking <laughs> awesome yeah and that, you know and it, it it's so unique it does it, you don't even have to put a color on it it's just it's unique insane music like it's so it's just an innovative and and all and still stands up my favorite bad range is called black dots mm -hmm. and it's really really live sounding recordings of them and i and i fucking love it it's you know it's got a lot of the stuff that became other records but I love is just so fast and dirty and so much attitude to it. And it's like to think about at the time when it was happening, like no one was doing that. But then also to think about at the time, it's like it's like put it on today. It's better than anything I can listen to today. Like, oh I'm yeah, sorry. I agree. I mean, mm -hmm. and I go and I go back and forth between three Bad Brains albums. I go back and forth between the self-titled, you know, the yellow one, yeah. Rock for Light and Quickness. You know, I mean, I just love mm -hmm. those three albums. And it's funny because I, I go, it for go listen to go listen to Black Dots. It's, I'll, it, I definitely it, will. Yeah. To me, it just, it checks all the boxes. What I meant by emphasizing the fact that they were four Jamaican Rastafarians, it was because I knew growing up that 
being from New York and seeing what you would call skinheads on like the talk shows like Donahue and yeah. Geraldo and shit like that, where, you know, that became unfairly associated with uh, the hardcore scene. And yeah. to me, it's like, I'm always someone who would rather focus on the positive. And the fact that the first hardcore band to, to break out were the Bad Brains, it's like, I think that just goes to show you that leave your freaking political race bullshit at the door. I mean, there's no, yeah. there's no, no, no point for that. There's no reason to exude yeah. that kind of mentality, especially when it comes to music, just fucking enjoy it. Yeah. And that's, you know, do what you do, what you love and enjoy it. All it takes is one schmuck to ruin it for everybody. Yeah. It's one of those things. I mean, I, you know, I, I grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood and, you know, and my home life wasn't that good. And when stuff would be really bad, my black neighbors would take me in and, you know, and help me. And like when anything in the neighborhood that was going down wasn't right, mm -hmm. we all banded together. It was like, there's no difference between, oh, that's a white family and they're shitty to their kid. Fuck him. Like, oh, dude. I mean, I grew up in a story of Queens. So. Yeah. And vice versa, you know, to, to the way we took people in. Um, you know, like I don't feel that with any of my neighbors in the neighborhood I live in now. Mm -hmm. and they're all white <laughs> so like i don't know if times have changed but uh i definitely don't couldn't depend on i couldn't be going through something so bad that i could hand my kid to a neighbor and be like watch him for a couple hours i need to go take care of this where when i was a kid that happened all the time and we talked to our neighbors and we dealt with them and we understood what their life was going through and their challenges and they understood what our life was going through our challenges and like and just in a whole societal thing maybe that's changed but that's like i i definitely thing. think it's changed yeah. because uh, as i mentioned growing up in astoria queens i went to Bryan high school the same high school as shaka and, and Nizek. granted i graduated a decade later but um you know when i was going to school i mean we had white kids black kids indian kids muslim kids yeah you know uh different variation of european you know you had spanish you had croatian and we just didn't give a shit we were just like yeah. those things were irrelevant it's like our differences weren't enough to divide us it's like we were all going through this thing called high school together yeah and for many of us it sucked but we made it better for each other you know like yeah. uh two of my friends uh the wiggins brothers uh, John and Jamala. Um, great guys, served our country in the military. And I remember telling Jana when things went down last summer, I don't want to mention what it was, but I said that, you know, people like him, his friendship, it, it made high school more bearable for me. And I said, thank yeah. you. You know, and he was just like, I didn't even know I did that. And I'm like, well, you did. So, yeah. you know, just to know that I told him that it was a big deal it was a big deal for me to survive high school and having friends of, you know, different, and it's not like it really mattered what was yeah. what, who was what it was just, you know, are you a cool person? Can I chill with you? Yeah. You know, and if anything, it's that's like, what that, matters. Should, that should, should be celebrated. Like the differences and, 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 and what people bring to the table should be celebrated. And like, the, you know, the, the, and either side, it's like, you know, they're, they're victimizing, people before their victims and and you know and it's just like the whole the whole thing and approach is, is you know again i just feel like i live in an idealistic world where i think every, no every, every no man, you don't race should be treated equal <laughs> i i i think kindness and empathy are not weaknesses yeah yeah and i and i learned that except for when you're booking hardcore shows except when you're yeah. booking hardcore shows. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned that from the friends that I made in the hardcore scene. I learned that from my family and here I am at 40 years old. You know, I still adhere to those principles to this day and I'm not changing it for anybody. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, that's a good point. Like it, everything in my life is from the hardcore scene. Yep. Like, um, and, you know, and, and I always say like I adopted another family you know, I turned 16 and I, and I went out and looked for another family and that family was a hardcore scene and it's another fucked up dysfunctional family, but like <laughs> everything in my life is, you know, 
is from the Harcourt scene, like, you know, Brian Smith from Loyal to None, like, I wouldn't have interned at Pi. I met him at shows. I wouldn't have got into college to go to school for recording if it wasn't for, like, another hardcore musician, you know? And, and, then, and then that led me to, like, getting the, you know, I got the job at MLB because one of the guys that got me hired there was a hardcore kid who, like, I knew and did a bunch of recording with. Like, so, like, everything has pulsated from the hardcore scene. And, and I keep saying, like, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know how to relate as anything else besides the old well, hardcore kid. Our friendship is, <laughs> our friendship yeah. is, our friendship is because one time Jake Crawford and I, with our old band, Surrender to Providence, played a show in, um, queens at a venue called the red zone there was this band kiss the bottle with uh julie rose yeah uh who was a singer at the time we became friends a year later she, uh she introduced us and here we are 17 years after we met and we're talking yeah. so yeah. you know i'm 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 eternally grateful for that yeah so so, so i'm just gonna ask a couple more questions and uh, then we'll wrap it up which producer would you say influenced you the most to pursue audio engineering? You know, I'd say William Whitman because he was like a mentor. Mm -hmm. Then also um, Rick Chertoff, who you could look him up. He he produced a ton of records. He's had a, a you know a great career, and and I really learned from him that well. One, I learned never say no to a musician, but always get your way. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um but always try everything take the time to try stuff you know um you you know and, and again like you might even be influenced and also just try to have really good taste for the music that you're working on because i think one thing that i noticed uh, um you know being a fly on the wall for his sessions when whitman was engineering and then i engineered a few records for him when i was in douglaston and it just was like he just has great taste and a vision and like he, you know he gets you there and it's 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 pretty wild but you know it's just it's all about taste and and knowing what works and 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 taste and feel and you know i think that's the biggest thing about anything to do with art you know is you know is just knowing what colors to use and knowing when it's done just like knowing what instruments to use knowing who should be playing those instruments and knowing when it's done if anyone wants to get in touch with you to hire you for your services, how can they? I would say just email me. I'm like hardly on Facebook. There are people that try to contact me on Facebook. I never look at it. You could uh, look me up on Instagram, GG Fulham, or, uh, or email me at generalgf at gmail. Do you have any advice or any words of knowledge that you want to drop on anyone who wants to pursue uh, music either as a hobby or as a possible career, either as a musician or as an engineer? So I'll start with engineering. Engineering is like anyone could record anything anywhere at this point. Um, I, I would say uh, don't put a ton of pressure on uh, the gear you have right away. Um, just just see who you can record and work through it. You know, you're going to make some mistakes at first or whatever. Um, and there's tons of YouTube videos and all that stuff. Like now is the best time to learn how to become a recording engineer because you have so much at your fingertips to learn how to do stuff for free. Um, and then as a music producer, it, it depends on what you want to do. Like if you're doing R&B and hip hop and stuff, that's a whole different animal because you're, you're building tracks, you're making beats, you're doing all that stuff. Um, but also, it, you know, if, if, if you're doing, you know, production and you want to get into a little bit of like uh, song structure and all that stuff, I would say go to local coffee shops and go to open mic nights and, and, and sit around and wait for someone to like that you like and, and say, hey, you want to go work with me? I know an engineer, I could do some stuff. Or, um, or, or look at local schools, but now all that stuff shut down, so you're screwed. Um, go into banking, investment banking. The hedge fund thing is pretty cool. No, uh, no, um, no, no. After what happened with Robinhood, <laughs> no. Um, I would, uh, I, I would say, 
And then if you're like a, a musician, you can always find someone to play with. If you're a, uh, you know, a, a guitarist and, and you don't feel like your songs are that good, you can find a singer songwriter to work with. Hey, I need to play with this. I, you know, I need to play with this. I, you know, there, there's always other people out there that are willing to play with you um, on anything. Right. You know, mm-hmm. you might not be what you like right away, but you might learn a ton of stuff. Like, I, I don't know, like, you know, I met, I was, you know, a couple months ago, I was in CVS and the, the guy be, you know, it's one o'clock in the morning and the guy behind the counter was like bummed out about something. And I was talking to him and he's like, Oh, I just want to be home writing music. And I was like, well, well what are you doing here? And he's like, Oh, I got to pay bills. And I was like, well, what do you do when you go home? I was like, you're writing songs. He's like, well, you know, uh, you know, I make beats and stuff like that. And I was like, well, you can find songwriters. You can find songwriters. You can find artists. If, if you have the drive and talent to do that stuff, do it. I was like, come to work here every day. This is just passing your time. I was like, this is your means to an end. You're paying rent right now or you're buying new gear. I was like, just do it. I was like, you can find people to do anything. Put an ad out. Hey, I'm a producer. I want to make beats for you. Someone will show up because you're giving it to them for free. And then you're working with that person. You can write a hit song with that person in three years. Who knows? Just do it. Don't sit around and complain about it. You know, it's like when I wanted, when I had time in the studio and I could record a band, it was like, I'd call up, hey, Gary, you got any projects you want to do? Hey, you want to do this, blah, blah. It's like I set this studio up down here and it was like, I put feelers out and I'm like working on one of the best records I've ever recorded. Ice School Killers record comes out in May. Um, watch for it. Yeah, watch for it. So, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, I mean, obviously I had 20 years experience and I know a lot of people who record. But uh, or I know a lot of musicians, but it it's like there's always someone willing to do something, especially if you start off giving your services for free, you'll get you'll get work. I don't care <laughs> if you're recording in your mom's kitchen, you'll get work. You know, mm-hmm. if, if if you come out of the box and you think you're gonna make, you know, if you think you're gonna be a Kanye or something like that right out of the box, that he busted his ass. The first couple of years he busted his ass and and still while he was making his first couple of hits he was still busting his ass i don't even really like his music that much but i understand the work and the talent that that dude puts into his, his songs you gotta get credit where it's due absolutely yeah. yeah yeah so like there there is no easy road like even the people who hustle and stuff comes to them they're hustling that's work yeah so I don't know if that answered your question. No, it did. It did. It's sage advice. What I want to do is I'm going to conclude this episode of the podcast by saying when my wife and I came to him to uh, meet with him about discussions before recording her album, I originally thought you hire a producer to do X, Y, and Z. Well, George from the get-go always said that he was an engineer, but he always made it a point of what do you want? Meaning... What do you, as the artist, uh, as the person, you know, who's performing the music, well, you know, what do you want in terms of sounds, in terms of the audio experience that you want to provide for the listener? And I'm really proud of the fact that you made me think of, you made Aaron and I think about what we wanted to do with her album before we went in there. And it, it made the recording experience a lot more easier and a lot more fun and at the same time challenging because it pushed us to get the best performances out there. And I came into it thinking that my shit didn't stink. I'll be the first to admit that because I was in a, I came, I had come from a toxic environment of uh, bands in the past and working with George humbled me. And I feel like that it got the best performances out of me. And I learned more from you than probably anybody else than I did in my 20 years of performing, writing, recording music to a point where a lot of what you taught me, I still use. For me, you were the not only one of the best friends, but also one of the best engineers that I had the pleasure to work with and one of the best teachers. And I still adhere to a lot of the principles that you taught me to this day. You know, when I, when I write a song, 
I write for the song, not to feed my own ego. To me, that's more important than playing a million notes per second, knowing what to play and when not to play. I learned that from you, my friend. And I've, I've always wanted to say thank you. So that's, thank you. That means a lot to me. So thank you for saying it. I also got you to play clean guitar, which you were like, what? <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Put a this little is... reverb on that nice clean guitar. You know, it's what the songs wanted. Um, it, it, I don't know. I don't think I'm the best in the business by far. But you know um, your shit. I know my shit and, and, you know, and, and I try to make the experience of recording the most positive it can be, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, you know, uh, you know, it, unless I, you know, I'm trying to get a singer to be a certain way and I got to push his buttons to get stuff done, but you know, <laughs> I give me an asshole sometimes. If you want to hear what George has done, check out discogs.com. If you type in George Fullan, F-U-L-L-A-N, check out George's resume over on discogs.com. And if you could find any of the stuff, please purchase it because George wouldn't put his name on anything that was shit. I say that for a fact. <laughs> so George, I just want to say thank you for uh, coming on the Music is Live podcast and indulging me and entertaining the viewers and listeners for as long as we have, which is at this point, almost three hours. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you, thank you for having me and good luck editing this interview. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do the best I can, but um, anyways. If you need me to say, welcome to part two of the... <laughs> nah, yeah. I'll be all right. George, thank you so much for being on board with this. Don't forget to uh, check out Rat Style Review Network on YouTube and subscribe. Also check us out on available podcast platforms, iTunes, Google, Spotify, Amazon, Pandora, if you still listen to Pandora, and please like and subscribe to the music is live podcast on youtube as well please comment we do accept donations music is life podcast at gmail.com through paypal and shout out to all the other shows on the network including beyond bushido and also right opinion suck my balls the south park podcast and also Vieira vault with ralph Vieira, aka dr fuck and also some love for aaron and chris over at decibel geek and with that, I say, George, thanks for being a part of the show. Thank you. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Same here, my friend. And right. peace out to everyone. Have a great night. Music is live podcast. Here's your, bleh, let me take that again. Five, <laughs> four, three, stop laughing. <laughs>